Prepare to set fire to the index card of allowable opinion. Your daily dose of liberty education starts here. The Tom Woods Show. My new book, Diary of a Psychosis, is out. It's the most lively, devastating baseball bat to the throat takedown of what the public health establishment did in 2020 and beyond that you can imagine. It's my first book in nine years, and you're going to love it. Check it out at diaryofcovid.com. And if you've already bought it, make sure also to visit diaryofcovid.com so you can claim your free bonuses, including my free companion volume, Collateral Damage, a collection of stories from real people who suffered under the restrictions. They weren't allowed to tell their stories at the time, but every one of them told me, we just want to be heard. Check it all out at diaryofcovid.com. Hey, everybody, welcome to episode number 2,444 of the Tom Wish Show. I don't know what I feel like I have to prove here still, but but here we are, and I'm delighted to be joined once again by our old friend David Ramsey Steele. And some of you may know him, uh, of course, from being previously on the Tom Wood Show, but, but even beyond that, um, I think probably, David, the book you're best known for is the book From Marx to Mises, Post-Capitalist yes. Society and the Challenge of Economic Calculation. Is it safe to say that? Yes. Okay. Very safe. Yes. <laughs> well, today we're going to be talking about things that are quite unsafe. We've got some very challenging yeah. topics indeed to keep us, uh, to sink our teeth into today because David is on the verge of releasing uh, yet another book, uh, this one with the rather unusual title, The Conquistador with His Pants Down, and the subtitle is David Ramsey Steele's Legendary Lost Lectures. So, David, welcome back. Glad to have you. Yeah, glad to be here. So, I'm going to ask what anybody asks with a collection of essays. I've released them. I've read and enjoyed many collections of essays, but sometimes, or in this case, um, derived from lectures. Sometimes they're just uh, a bunch of things that have been published in obscure places and you want to have another book to your credit, you throw them all in there. But there does seem to be, through these varying topics, an interesting thread running through them all. What would you say that is? I would say that that's very percipient of you to have spotted that. <laughs> and I think... Well, thank uh, you. When, I, when I, put the, I put this together, it was just a collection of some of my recent stuff. Um, uh, but um, on reflection, there is a there is a, 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 th- a dominant theme, uh, and uh, there are several dominant themes. But one theme is that we live in a at a point in time where old religions have uh, are somewhat enfeebled, like Christianity and Islam and uh, Judaism. Um, but where new religions like global warming and transgenderism are extremely powerful. Uh, and these new religions, um, they all appeal to science. They all claim to be scientific. Uh, and um, my view is that uh, I, I'm, I'm a sort of rationalist rethinker of going way back, uh, like Voltaire and people like that, uh, that we have to recognize that the enemy of progress is no longer the uh, theology and the uh, theistical or supernaturalist religions, but it's the modern scientific religions, which of course are pseudo-scientific. They're not genuine science, um, but they have many of the qualities of um, of relig- uh, religions, and they're much more. Da- they're at least as dangerous uh, as t- today as the old religions. Well, let's try to unpack uh, why it is that people would be drawn to uh, what you're describing as new religions or or delusions of of one sort or another. And, and so that's going to take me into, uh, as a segue, uh, in, into the essay you have in there about uh, Scott Adams, we all know as the, the creator of Dilbert, yes. and as a controversial commentator, and as an analyst of, of the Trump phenomenon. And he yes. is known for arguing that facts don't matter. And by that he means, uh, in general, that persuasion uh, doesn't necessarily succeed because you have more facts on your side, that, that we are in some ways non or irrational as, as human beings, and we are drawn to conclusions through means other than reason. And so that, I, I would say parenthetically, one might take what Scott Adams is claiming and say that that's one of the reasons people are drawn 
to delusional takes on things. Uh, for example, one reason could be, and by the way, I know you're not favorable towards Scott Adams, but one reason some people appear to uh, latch on to popular but diluted ideas is that they see all the influential people doing so. And I have a friend, Jeff Lescovar, who has a whole full-blown theory on this, that there are people uh, who just cannot imagine not being part of the mainstream, can't imagine not being part of the popular group. Right. Right. And he says this right. goes back to times when people had to stay together in, in tribal groups. And if you have some dissenting voice, you ain't going to be no part of the tribe no more. And so it became uh, a, a matter of survival that you just agree with whatever the herd says that that has persisted down the ages. Do you think there's any plausibility to that? Oh, absolutely I do. Actually, I don't develop that much in this, in this particular collection. Um, but it's something I've been thinking about a lot recently. And um, my, my view is something like this. When you're at school and they tell you certain things like the capital of Portugal is Lisbon or um, two plus two equals four, there are two ways you can take that. You can, you can um, take it as saying that uh, it refers to something objective in external reality that happens to be true and that the teacher is fortunately telling you or you, can, or you can take it that all that matters is that you agree with the teacher. Um, and I think that uh, most people on most things uh, take the latter view. Uh, they think that what's really important is not to get it right in terms of objective fact, uh, but to uh, agree with, uh, with the consensus. Um, and of course, um, this enables them to get along and have a quiet life. Now, they can't practice this consistently like, if you want to know what time that bus leaves the station, uh, you don't say, oh, I've heard two different views, so neither of them are true, or anything like that. Um, you, you, you know that there is an objective fact, um, and that's independent of what anybody happens to be telling you, including, incidentally, the bus station, if you call them, because they can get it wrong. Um, so, um, but, so people, in practical matters, people have a way of knowing that there is an objective truth. Whereas in anything that doesn't touch upon their uh, concrete everyday life, um, they, they tend to think that there is no objective truth except to agree. Let, let's talk, though, about this, uh, this Scott Adams uh, idea, because this has become quite fashionable uh, to say. I, I hear it from uh, quite a number of sources that if you're going to try to reach people, um, Long series of a, a long series of logical propositions isn't going to do it, or even a rational argument oftentimes isn't going to do it. So, for instance, if I want to object to the way public health carried out the COVID response, I ought to focus less on charts and graphs and more on stories of people who suffered under the restrictions. So, no, so you've heard this too, um, and so what do you think is wrong with that? Is there something wrong with that? Yes. <laughs> yes, I, I, now I think we have to allow a certain element of uh, element of truth in it, in, and that is, you know, Aristotle wrote a book about logic, but he also wrote a book of, about persuasion called the rhetoric. Um, so there is such a thing as rhetoric, which is presenting um, presenting arguments in a favorable light and getting them the maximum uh, sympathy from your audience. So those there there are those two different things, uh, but but it, it seems to me that the uh, the latter does not abolish the former. In other words, there is an objective truth about any matter of fact, um, and um, uh, most people don't develop this very much. Well, let's think though about, um, for example, the the Trump phenomenon. There are people who might very well change on a dime. How they feel about certain people uh, in in politics, for example, Vivek Ramaswamy, whom for a few days or a couple of days they didn't like him because Trump said not to like him, that he was suspicious and well, we should be wary of him. And then he invited Vivek on to st on the stage with him and said he was a, a smart guy with a bright future. So then then they liked him. Right. Or Ron DeSantis was a bad guy because he's Ron DeSanctimonious. But then he became Governor Ron DeSantis. And uh, a, a really great guy, and I look forward to working with him. So okay, so we like him. Now, not all Trump supporters are that way, 
And it's not just Trump who's guilty of this kind of thing. And, and it's, it's more the supporters than the candidate. But I've seen people change on a dime, uh, right. e- even though nothing about the facts of the matter have changed. Uh, just something like, well, this, this, this person told me to think this way, so I'll adopt it and I'll think this way. That, seems to, that phenomenon seems to suggest there's something more than pure reason at work. Right. Well, there, is, there are several things. I think one thing is that we, we accept theories. And these theories can never be, no theory can ever be completely validated. Uh, and, uh, but we accept a theory and sometimes very elaborate theories. And we tend to stick to our theories. In other words, believe in them. Uh, until there's a crisis in our beliefs. Um, so that's one thing, and that, and that I maintain is perfectly rational. That's a perfectly sensible thing to do. You shouldn't be too ready to abandon the theory that you've got so far uh, for some slight, uh, some very superficial uh, counter-argument. Um, so there is that. Um, now, one, what, if, if, we, if we take the case of Scott Adams, one of the things I point out is that he says there is no such thing as truth, or if there is, we, we do, we're not equipped. But, you know, to quote the movie, we can't handle the truth, right? That's what, that's what Scott says. By the way, I do have a very high opinion of him, um, uh, and I've learned a lot from him, but that, this is one area where I think he's hopeless. Um, so um, one of the things I point out is that Scott Adams is constantly appealing to facts to support his arguments. Constantly. Um, and if I also point out there are many facts that become accepted across the board by everybody. Like, for example, everybody accepts um, that, uh, that, that Trump became president in 2016. Uh, you know, there was no, there, there was no um, uh, group, no substantial group of people saying that, um, that uh, really we were be, we, there'd been a coup d'etat by, by space aliens. And this was all pretense that there was that Trump was in the White House, right? So there are certain things that just get accepted because the facts are overwhelming, um, and there are other things that, you know, don't get accepted. Another point I make is that a lot of these, a lot of the silliest things that people do when they're confronted with a challenge to their belief system, is very temporary and makeshift. And you, if you just look at a couple of months after some major development. Uh, you're not get, people haven't had time to fully adjust. It's going to take years before they fully adjust. Uh, so that's so some of these very crazy things are due to this short short term um, perspective that Scott tends to apply to political developments. So, if you're trying to convince somebody of of, of the the problems with Marxism, I mean the thing is, I think. I think I've been somewhat persuaded a bit by this whole thing because I feel like if if you look at our side of things, we our side has produced enormous tomes and and uh, ex- extraordinary treatises that to me are extremely well argued. They're elegant. They build a whole system that's very intellectually satisfying. And yet, I have no confidence at all that if I continue to write treatises like this, it's going to make a, a bit of difference to anybody. And I guess after a while uh, of, of observing that and seeing that, for example, now we have the internet. Now you don't have to rely on Dan Rather and the three television networks. Uh, now you you have everything at your at your fingertips. Yes. And almost nobody explores any of it. Now that's not right. the same thing as being irrational, but it it does say something, doesn't it? Yes. I mean, I think I think uh, you know online exchanges are in their infancy. Uh, and we haven't we haven't yet arrived at a point where every generation, every every living generation, is um, is fully on uh, fully uh, um, accommodated to this uh, this kind of argument. And I think some of the problems we see are because only younger people uh, are crowding into some of these areas of discourse, and older people tend to be underrepresented. And that will gradually take care of itself. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that. Um, that uh, for this idea that that um, that uh, we're all irrational and we can't get at the truth, uh, this is this is this is the predominant in at least in popular culture. This is the predominant view in our society. 
Um, and it, it predates really uh, Trump and Scott Adams. It predates those people. You know, there'll, there'll be people writing books saying uh, that, we're, that we're totally irrational for a long time. Um, and I think there's something paradoxical about that, of course. You're writing a book to prove to people uh, objectively, that they are irrational. <laughs> so there is a paradox there. Hey, folks, a word from our sponsor, Bank on Yourself. Are you being lied to? Wall Street tells you to put your money in an IRA or 401k. Yet studies show the average American who follows that advice will outlive his savings by 10 years. Bank on Yourself is a better way to grow and protect your hard-earned money. This retirement plan alternative has never had a losing year in over 160 years. With Bank on Yourself, your plan doesn't go backward when the markets tumble. Your principal and growth are locked in. You'll know what your tax rate will be in retirement. Zero under current tax law, which protects you from the coming tax tsunami. You're in control. You get access to your money for any purpose with no questions asked and without government penalties or restrictions on how much income you can take or when you can take it. Try doing that with a 401k or IRA. Do you want guaranteed, predictable annual growth, control of your money, and tax-free retirement income? Then go to bankonyourself.com woods, and we'll send you a free report with the proven retirement plan alternative that banks and Wall Street are desperately hoping you never hear about. Just go to bankonyourself.com woods for your free report. Bankonyourself.com woods. Well, and, and no doubt, the... the, the um, there are paradoxes in in the whole Scott Adams way of looking at things because because of the way he himself argues seems to contradict some of his um, some of his claims. But when when you talk about what you described as as mass delusions uh, and so or as substitute religions, let's say, so mm -hmm. you talked about climate change, you talked about uh, modern gender theory, things like this, and you have a discussion of this in the book. Um, how? If 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 it's not a question of human beings being irrational, how do we get into this situation where major things that the elites believe, and that by extension a, a great many average people believe, uh, are are false and destructively so? Right. Um, I think you know that with time, some of them will that will evaporate, um, uh, and. Um, I think you know part of the problem is that um, that that we that we don't have much time for some of these things. Uh, but um, yeah, I, I mean, I think that um, uh, I I would be amazed. Of course, I won't be around to be amazed. I'd be amazed if forty years from today anybody still believes that minute additions to the amount of atmospheric CO two could possibly pose a serious threat. To uh, the human species, I, if anybody believes, I, I don't think anybody will believe that in forty years' time. In fact, I think there are a lot of things like that which um, they not only won't believe them, they won't believe you when you tell them that people used to believe this because it's so utterly silly <laughs> that that they will say no, 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 nobody really well, believes that. Well, I feel like that's probably true in the extremely long run when people look back on people wearing masks and they look like idiots and there's all this evidence that they obviously don't do anything or people playing musical instruments through a hole in a mask or whatever. Right. People are going to have a hard time believing that anybody did that or, or that, that people think that if I, if I hang a small piece of plexiglass in front of where I'm standing, that no virus could get around it or whatever. Yeah, I think people will look at that and, and, uh, and just be appalled or 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 in, it's just incredulous at, at that just bustle. but yeah, i think that's 500 yes. years from now you, you think it's much sooner no i think it's i think it's 50 years or less i i yeah but uh, but it's true uh i do i do actually tend to take um the long view of some of these intellectual developments um you you know the difference between um an englishman and an american you've heard this i um, have not uh Okay, the Eng an Englishman is someone who thinks 100 miles is a long way. An American is someone who thinks 100 years is a long time. That, that, that makes sense. Uh, and, uh, you know, when, uh, I often, like, when I talk about, um, for example, uh, I've, I've just whipped this out of the air, uh, that in a, if, and if you have de capitalism developing 
uh, fairly lustily, um, like you do in China today, it's going to eventually cause um, a, 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 an appetite for liberty. It's going to cause certain things to happen in society, which lead to more liberty. Uh, people misunderstand me and think I'm going to. This is going to happen in the next twenty years, and I'm not saying that at all. But I think it, in the in a hundred years it will happen, right? Um, so, uh, so I think the time scale is important. Well, let's uh, switch gears here, and um, I want to talk a bit about Marxism because you know it, there's a sense in which it's it's still relevant, and there's a sense in which it isn't. Uh, in the sense that uh, these days it it obviously has morphed into something else. It's morphed into right. something Marx himself wouldn't have recognized. You don't hear really that many people talking about the economic ideas of Marxism or historical materialism. I mean, this all seems very passe. But nevertheless, a, a general worldview of opp oppressor and oppressed uh, in, in, in which there's a, a bright future in which the, the oppressors get what's coming to them, that's still very much alive. But yes. you have a chapter saying that regardless of all that, just because of the, the nature of, of Marxism itself, it is impossible, as you say, for there ever to be a Marxist revolution. Now, how is that? Right. Um, so I'm talking about uh, a revolution as Marx conceived it, and as all the early Marxists up until 1970 conceived it. Uh, I think that's strictly impossible. Uh, it's impossible for two reasons. Well, there's one fundamental reason and one uh, derivative reason. Um, the fundamental reason is that the kind of society that Marx thought would emerge after capitalism uh, cannot actually exist. And the reason for, there are several reasons for that. And I'd give two, I have this article where I talk about two of them, uh, in particular the Mises uh, economic calculation argument, which basically the bottom line there is that if you want um, an industrial society which is able to give the masses high living standards, uh, then you must have a price system, and it must be a fully functioning price system that conveys information. And that means uh, you need private property uh, because you can't have a proper pricing of assets without private property. So, um, so that's one thing. Uh, the, other, the other reason I give is, is the very interesting Michael's argument that um, in any big organization, uh, there's going to be uh, a leadership, and, and the bigger the organization, the more complex the organization, the bigger the gulf between the leaders and the mass of the members, so to speak. So, uh, so uh, Marx thought of communism as being a very completely democratic system. Um, contrary to what you might think with what happened later in Marxism, Marx didn't think that communism would be ruled by a party or an elite of any kind. Uh, it was very much a kind of um, very similar to anarcho-communism, except in the transitional phase. Uh, so, um, but that's that's it, completely impossible, and it's impossible for organisational reasons, because Marx is also committed to what what was called a single vast plan. <laughs> you know, that's an actual quote from Marx's close friend Engels uh, in anti Um that. This was what would replace capitalism. Uh, you see, you see, Marx and Engels had they saw that there were bigger and bigger companies in the marketplace, bigger and bigger corporations, uh, and then uh, and then they saw the beginning of the trusts movement, which actually was a bit bogus because most of these trusts were very short lived, um, and most of them weren't able to, uh, you know, actually cartelize the industries that they tried to cartelize, uh, but still. They thought that everything was getting was get organizationally was getting on a bigger and bigger scale, um, and um, and therefore the ult the ultimate would be one big organization governing everything, but which would be under democratic control. Well, I think we can see today. First of all, that hasn't happened. I mean, it's had plenty of time to happen. Secondly, it's not being approached. Um, a, a lot of Marxists still think it is being approached because they notice there are gigantic corporations. But the point is. There are still there are many more small firms as well as those gigantic corporations, and in fact, the the gigantic corporations need an environment of many small firms in order to in order to exist. Uh, so um, so we're not actually moving towards uh, fewer and fewer uh, firms or fewer and fewer companies. Um, 
there's no sign of that whatsoever. And secondly, it can't happen because if, if it did happen, there'd be no price system uh, because there'd be no independent um, uh, uh, autonomous uh, entities. So, so uh, but then if you add to that the requirement that, uh, the, uh, that Marx would have insisted on, that it all has to be democratic and under the control of the people, you see that that's based on a kind of fairy tale notion of democracy. You know, when 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 you get a big organization, it's always run by a few people. That's what Michels pointed out. Um, that uh, you know, you everybody owning everything means nothing because the, the people who actually control and therefore own in a realistic sense are going to be a tiny handful, and that's inescapable because of the nature of organizations. But it's also inescapable because. The, the idea of ownership implies control over something. And I obviously can't get the, the consent of half a million people, let's say, every time I want to use something. Now, and I, I grant you, we're talking about, um, we're not talking about consumer goods here. So I, I don't mean that I have to ask half a million people if I can use my toothbrush or not. But, but nevertheless, how could I run an operation if it's collectively owned? That means everybody has a say in what I can and can't right, do with it. Right. So in yeah, practice, no, it means some people will make the decisions. Yes, yes. Uh, in practice, it, it means that a handful of people will make the decisions, or, or, or if not one person. Um, but uh, yeah, that, that's absolutely true, and it should be clear. Um, I, and I think if you take a very long view, and here it comes back to the Englishman's view, um, then you see that this has grudgingly and gradually been accepted. Uh, you know, um, I grew up in a world where there was the Soviet Union, there was... Um, there was the People's Republic of China. They all claimed to be socialist systems which were trying to plan everything and were moving towards full, what they called full communism. Uh, now both China and Russia are completely and utterly capitalist in their organization. And as a result, they've become rich and successful. Um, and the, and there, there are a few holdouts like in Venezuela and North Korea where people still have these these ideas of uh, that are closer to the notion of a single vast plan, uh, but generally speaking, it's 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 disappeared. Um, and one of one of the points I make actually in in a couple of places in this book is that a lot of pessimists will look at what's going on and they will say, "Oh, um, uh, the left has um, the left has got bigger and bigger," and in a sense, that's true. But the left. The views of the left are more wishy-washy than they used to be. Uh, you know, they talk about um, injustice and uh, gender and uh, race. Uh, they 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 no longer, you very rarely meet a leftist today who will say the government ought to nationalize everything tomorrow morning. Um, but that was quite commonplace uh, 60, 70 years ago. Um, you know, when I was forming my political attitude 60 or 70 years ago, that was a very commonplace view. Um, and it's 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 largely disappeared. Uh, you know now what what's replaced it in some ways is even more horrifying. <laughs> you know with transgenderism and cutting off the, the genitals of little kids and all that kind of stuff. You know we're living in this insane uh, nightmare world. Uh, but uh, but the, in practice they have conceded that uh, the the kind of socialism that used to be pr proposed back in the 40s and 50s and 60s, uh, that nobody's proposing it anymore. It's gone. Here's a quick message from our sponsor, Blinkist. In our day and age, we are faced with information overload, and I have an excellent way to deal with it. With the Blinkist app, you can absorb huge amounts of information in 27 nonfiction categories. History, philosophy, parenting, career, technology, religion, and on and on. Blinkist condenses each of thousands of different books into 15-minute summaries you can read or listen to. So if you have a half-hour commute each way, you can absorb the equivalent of four books. You think that might get a little information into the old noggin, make you a more impressive person? And among the thousands and thousands of titles at Blinkist, you'll also find libertarian classics by Murray Rothbard, Milton Friedman, and even a work by your host here, Tom Woods. Right now, Blinkist has a special offer just for our audience. Go to Blinkist.com slash Woods to start your seven-day free trial and get 25% off a Blinkist premium membership. That's Blinkist, spelled B-L-I-N-K-I-S-T, 
Blinkist.com slash Woods to get 25% off and a seven-day free trial. Blinkist.com slash Woods. And now for a limited time, you can even use Blinkist Connect to share your premium account. You'll get two premium subscriptions for the price of one. Again, we just given the nature of a book of essays. I, I want to sh- switch gears yet again because I, I've, we've got to talk about Sam Harris. And oh, in right. particular, I want to read a passage of his that you have in your book on page 111 and, and uh, try to unpack this here. He says, Some propositions are so dangerous that it may even be ethical to kill people for believing them. This may seem an extraordinary claim, but it merely enunciates an ordinary fact about the world in which we live. Certain beliefs place their adherents beyond the reach of every peaceful means of persuasion while inspiring them to commit extraordinary acts of violence against others. There is, in fact, no talking to some people. If they cannot be captured, and they often cannot, otherwise tolerant people may be justified in killing them in self-defense. Now, you... Uh, David Ramsey Steele have a little something to say about this. It turns out, <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes. Well, um, yeah. I mean, there are lot there are lots of things to be said, and I uh, I actually dealt with him quite gently and tried to be and tried to hold his hand and reason with him <laughs> in in that particular chapter. Um, I, I you see you if you put this in context, um, uh, two thousand and four, Sam Harris came from nowhere. And had a huge hit, uh, the book um, "The End of Faith." Uh, and the message, although it seems at first now there are there are different levels to that book, and there are different levels to its impact. An important part of of the impact of the book was that it enabled leftist intellectuals, uh, man. Of course, in leftist intellectuals today would mostly despise Sam Harris, but. At the time, 2004, um, it enabled leftist intellectuals to have a way of coming to terms with 9/11, which they which they would have which they had found embarrassing, because it, because 9/11 called for an automatic response that they didn't like, which was to be patriotic uh, and to blame foreigners for something that had happened, right? <laughs> Where you know so. Um, uh, whereas the left, of course, worships foreigners and anything that's anti-American, uh, and um, and and so on. Um, so so it it's, it enabled a lot of leftist intellectuals to come to terms. So basically, the argument was Osama bin Laden is the same as Jerry Falwell, right? So the enemy is religion, and religion leads to people killing and mass murder. So that's that's one level that's going on there. Um, the other thing is, if, if, if the, the and it's very strange how this was not commented upon at the time more frequently, is that basically there is an underlying message here that Islam is uniquely evil, much more so than Christianity or Judaism, uh, and it's and it's uniquely evil because the, because the, of suicide bombing, and suicide bombing occurs because the Quran says you've got to kill the infidel, and only for that reason. Now, there are many odd things about this claim. <laughs> uh, of course, there is the fact that uh, prior to 1981, there were no Muslim suicide bombers whatsoever, right? None. Uh, uh, so, so the idea that people got this by reading the Quran is there's something strange. Uh, then, of course, you might say, well, you know, the West has been bombing Arabs and other Islamic populations, uh, you know, massacring tens of thousands of them from time to time. Uh, maybe that's got something to do with it. Maybe this is, maybe this helps to account for what for what happened. Uh, but the, but of course, no, that couldn't possibly. What could what could the connection be? Um, so there is that. Um, but and, uh, stop um, right there for a minute, though, because as you were saying, um, you could see how nine eleven puts people in this especially people on the left in this particularly weird position because they 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 don't want to criticize anybody they want to they like criticizing their own civilization that's their favorite pastime they don't want to criticize anybody else but they could have with the line of argument that you're making here they could have said well they, maybe they might not put it quite so so crudely but well we had it coming to us for the things we were doing to them and and a lot of them the, the establishment left just wouldn't 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 go down that road Right, they were. They right. became Sam Harris. 
right? You, well, you know, the, the, that kind of left, of course, talking about the left is always hazardous because of so many different facets and different factions. Um, but there is always, there's always the more consistent left, like Noam Chomsky, uh, and the, the rather inconsistent left, which is, combines um, a kind of leftist veneer with a general approval of big government and anything it does, big American government and anything it does. Uh, so, so there is that. And, and of course, the latter uh, numerically pre pre preponderates. Uh, the closer you get to Washington, D.C., the more they preponderate. <laughs> Uh, and when you get to Washington D.C., you find that they regard themselves as rulers of the world. Uh, so, uh, so, so there is that. You know, there are these different facets of the left. Um, but you know, the other thing that it, this has been pointed out, and um, Sam Harris has attempted to respond to it, totally unconvincingly. But in the year, in the years, like the ten or twenty years after 9/11, uh, the biggest. Uh, Suicide bombers were the um, the Tamil Tigers from Sri, Sri Lanka, who were, who were atheists. Yeah. They were atheists. They were Marxists. They were totally opposed to theistic religion. They had Hindu backgrounds, uh, but um, they weren't Hindus by conviction, or at least they wouldn't admit to it. Uh, so um, they they were the biggest organization, and they account for over those years they account for more than a quarter of all suicide bombings. And then there is the fact that. Yeah, and then, of course, we owe a lot to Robert Pape uh, and his research into suicide bombing. So Robert Pape may, uh, as, and his associates have produced two books, and they, what they did, they compiled a database of all suicide bombings, um, and they found that a huge number of um, of uh, suicide bombings were conducted by uh, by atheists and secularists, and 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 also by Christians. And it's clear from what Sam Harris says that he had no... You see, Sam Harris didn't study Islam. He didn't spend a couple of weekends boning up on Islam. <laughs> he, just, he, just, he just listened to the news and he thought, oh, yes, they're bombing. Um, that these, these suicide bombers, they, um, they need the attentions of 72 virgins after they've, uh, after they've shuffled off this mortal coil. And therefore, they're convinced of that and that makes them suicide bombers. Uh, so... Um, what Pape showed, and, uh, and I think it's shown very conclusively because they analyze all the suicide bombings that have ever been recorded, um, is that suicide bombings overwhelmingly are the, re the resistance of and the hitting back of a militarily weak ethnic population that, is, that, is un that re perceives itself as being under foreign occupation. Um, that's, that's the explanation for suicide bombings. Um, but I raise a few other in, uh, points in the, in the chapter. Um, uh, and one of them is that uh, in all national cultures, um, there has been a great, uh, great praise, great, great uh, sanctity, uh, great approval of giving up your life for your side in the for your country or your monarch or for whatever, give it for your side in some uh, inter-ethnic conflict. This, this goes back. And it, uh, when I was a kid growing up in the 1950s, I often heard preachers uh, in Britain uh, say, quote the line from Jesus, greater love have no man than this, that he, that he uh, give up his, uh, lay down his life for his friends, right? Uh, and that was meant to say the people who died in the war was, and of course, a lot of the Germans, they killed uh, Christians, so that, you know, that sort of thing never interferes with these people. Uh, but yeah, so um, uh, the idea that there's something highly meritorious in dying deliberately in the pursuit of war against the enemy is very, very commonplace. Very, very commonplace. It's no, there's nothing, and it's not particularly, um, uh, doesn't have deep roots in Islam at all. Um, uh, and you know you have you you have various examples of of uh, suicide attacks throughout history, and I mentioned some of them. You know that you could compile a huge list of suicide attacks. Um, and of course, although it's probably not historical, you have the example of Samson. You know who um, who uh, pulled pulled the pillars together and, and caused this building to collapse, killing three thousand Philistines, men, women, and children. Uh, and this, you know, so you could say um, that was a, foot, a prophecy of 9/11, where 3,000 people 
uh, were killed. But anyway, um, by, by suicide. But so Samson committed suicide with the Lord's approval uh, as long as he took with him 3,000 Philistines. So there is this strain. And then there are all these anarchists in the 19th century who bombed and killed people. Uh, most, they were nearly all atheists. Um, and uh, and they did it be- for various reasons. Uh, uh, but anyway, they, they weren't Muslims. <laughs> That's my point. Uh, so so there is a whole, there is a whole um, history of this kind of thing. And it's not surprising that, uh, that um, you know, Osama bin Laden produced all these videos. I haven't, I haven't um, watched any great number of them, uh, but these videos were produced to recruit young Arabs, right? They weren't, they weren't, uh, they didn't have the intention of persuading the West. They had the intention of recruiting people. And he points, uh, it's quoted in one of Pape's books, um, that Osama bin Laden said, well, you know, these people uh, keep saying we want to destroy freedom, and that's why we, that's why we have these attacks on um, the United States. Well, why don't we attack Sweden? <laughs> why don't we attack Canada? You know, uh, we... And it's got nothing to do with that. It's because we're we're uh, we're um, we're we're promoting our freedom and our freedom from ocu- foreign occupation to wit, in this particular case, Israeli occupation with the backing of the United States um, and underwritten and made possible enabled by the United States. So um, you know now we can we can look at that and say, yeah, it's still terrible, and you shouldn't be doing it. If you if you you know if you want to look at it morally, you can say it's terrible to kill. Innocent people, uh, even though, but you shouldn't misrep- rep- misrepresent the motives of people who do this. They're not. They're not saying it says in the Quran to kill the infidel. In fact, Muslims accept that you don't go around uh, indiscriminately killing infidels. <laughs> That's accepted by by the vast majority of Muslims, and nearly all of them, I would say. Uh, but um, th- this is, um, you know, this is a political conflict, uh, and it's an interethnic conflict. Uh, I think the the other topic I want to make sure we we get to because we've talked about it you, you and I before, and you've written quite a, a, a bit on it is is the subject of George Orwell, and mm-hmm. now here's somebody because of the literary work he produced you would think would be um, oh I, I I don't know uh, inoculated against uh, let's say being swayed to a particular position on the basis of something other than strict reason. But I, okay, but you say in your chapter here, um, oh, well, here it is. Intellectuals may almost be defined as people who can easily be convinced of fanciful dogmas concerning matters of which they are comprehensively ignorant. So you say, Orwell was firmly convinced that capitalism was in its final throes and could be replaced only by some form of collectivism. He was convinced of this on grounds of economics and industrial organization, though he knew absolutely nothing of economics or industrial organization. It, it is astonishing to me that somebody like, like this, who, uh, who did believe that collectivism was inevitable uh, for whatever reason, could nevertheless write in ways that are so striking about the dangers of collectivism and not, I mean, surely he must have seen some tension there. Well, I think, I think the problem is all well, Orwell took the view, uh, and, and, this, and this, is, this is the thing. I mean, most people accept certain things and go through their life and never question them. Uh, and Orwell accepted, um, he, Orwell was converted to socialism from being an anti-socialist um, in the year 1936. Um, and he got, as he got more and more into it, he became more and more convinced of socialism. Um, and um, uh, so he thought, and he, and he not only believed that socialism was a good idea, uh, he believed that it was absolutely inevitable, that capitalism was doomed. This, this is a very central conviction of Orwell. Um, now, it's possible that if he'd lived, he died at the age of 46 in, in 1951, uh, was it, or 50, 1950, uh, yeah, uh, January 1950, um, at the age of 46. If he'd lived to be 76, I think there's a good chance he would have become pro-capitalist. Uh, but, um, but, you know, so Orwell often had good things to say about laissez-faire capitalism, or as he would say it, the, the lost world of, of before 1910, you know, that world 
uh, he, the, he thought there were lots of good things about it, and he was uh, nostalgic for it. Uh, but he, he heard so many people who, who were supposed to be qualified economists telling him that, um, that, that, uh, that capitalism was doomed. That it was that it was in its uh, in its last its last throw final throes of its death agony, uh, and he believed that he believed that from 1936 until his death. Uh, at least there is no indication that he ever said anything to question it. Um, so, uh, so this is Orwell's fixed view. Now, Orwell thought it, it, the the view he took and the view he he defended was that. Collectivism is going to replace capitalism. There's nothing we can do about it. And to talk about reviving capitalism is absolutely silly. Um, and, you know, he, uh, Orwell was acquainted, uh, Orwell reviewed The Road to Serfdom in 1944. Um, and, um, uh, and, and he said, yeah, so, so it's all very well to say. And that's, this is where Orwell is, is a slick user of words. He's a very, uh, a very good persuasive writer. And he says, uh, Orwell says the trouble with uh, with competitions is that somebody wins them, and that that's just supposed to be a, you know it, Orwell regarded that a, as a resounding sort of um, uh, riposte to anybody who wanted to talk about uh, free market capitalism. Yeah, you know, it, it, uh, but of course, and of course, it's not true. <laughs> uh, so, uh, and the people who may, many people may win. And uh, even if one person wins, they're not going to win permanently. <laughs> so, so, but anyway, um, but this was, so we all had this view. So then he, the, the view he took was, there are two ways that, that collectivism can develop. It can either be what he called oligarchical collectivism, uh, meaning totalitarianism, meaning something like Nazi Germany or the Soviet Union. Um, or it can be democratic collectivism. In which we'll have a collectivist system where everybody works for the government, as Orwell repeatedly said. Every in socialism, everybody works for the government. Everybody's a government employee, and the government owns everything. That's socialism, as he saw it. And this is the socialism of the twenties and thirties. It wasn't like wishy-washy socialism like came along later, mixed economy or any of that stuff. Um, so, uh, so Orwell, Orwell said, okay, we're going to have this system where. Um, where um, the government owns everything, everybody's a government employee, and there is democracy and approximately equal incomes. That was his conception of socialism. He said, now, we can either have, uh, collectivism can take two forms. It can either take the form of, of oligarchical collectivism, like Soviet Russia or 1984, or it can, or it can take the, fo uh, the form of democratic socialism, which is like old Come, come to think of it, there aren't any examples yet. <laughs> so, so, um, so, uh, so that this is this was his view, and he actually stated on a few occasions, two or three occasions, he stated, um, "It's possible that we're just doomed. That the, the democratic uh, socialism can't exist." Um, and uh, you know, he he he's wrote something suggesting that the only future for us all is totalitarianism. Um, and um, yeah, one th one thing about my researches on Orwell is there are all kinds of surprising things you've done up. And one is that the, the term totalitarianism was very well in use by the late twenties, uh, and it was among people who read political journals and that kind of people, intellectuals. It was extremely commonplace term uh, with different meanings in different groups. Uh, but but anyway, so he says. Um, uh, it's possible that we're faced with um, with totalitarianism. There is no other future. Uh, and uh, somebody wrote to him, Victor Gallant wrote to him and said, well, do you really think this? And he, he wrote back saying, well, maybe I was a bit too pessimistic. Maybe there's a chance for democracy to survive um, the abolition of capitalism. Uh, we won't know, this is what he says, we won't know until... Uh, a country with strong liberal traditions uh, uh, introduces a, a, a socialist system. So, the, so at the end of his life, he was a very strong supporter of the Labour government. And uh, it, people sometimes need reminding that the Labour government, which came into power in 1945, uh, nationalised a fifth of the British economy in a couple of years. Um, you know. Uh, and and they and they, at the time when they were doing this, 
they said this is the first step. Now, later on, of course, <laughs> the experience of those nationalized industries wasn't great, and they started backtracking and saying, oh, no, uh, mixed economy. Uh, it, it, whether, a, whether, a, uh, whether a business is state-owned or privately owned is to be judged on its merits, and we mustn't woodenly press ahead with nationalizing everything. Uh, but uh, there was that period where they came to power in 1945 uh, in, a, in, a, in a landslide, although they, they get, got less than 50% of the vote, but it was because of the electoral system. Uh, they got, uh, it was a landslide in Parliament. Um, and, and, they, uh, and they pushed through a lot of things. One of the things they pushed through was something we should be eternally grateful for, and that is independence for India. And thank goodness we might have had an earlier version of Vietnam if Winston Churchill had got his way and the British had made a stand in India. I can't imagine what a nightmare that would be. Uh, but, but so the, the Labour government did one wonderful thing. They got out of India um, and a, a few other places. Uh, uh, but but, they, but, but they, they had this view that this, the first step in introducing socialism was to nationalize what they called the commanding heights of industry. So steel, the railways, and all this, all, all these really crucial basic industries, they nationalized. So, th so this, was the, this was the spirit of the times. Um, and, uh, you know, we don't know how all well would have reacted later. Uh, so, but, of course, uh, one of the points that, that, that actually Hayek makes and, uh, and Orwell overlooked, because Orwell said, oh, we, we won't know how it's going to turn out until a, a country with really strong liberal traditions uh, introduces socialism. Well, the one thing he didn't actually bargain with is that they lose their liberal traditions. <laughs> um, that, 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 that be, be, just because they're introducing this big, uh, uh, this big sort of succubus of, of, the, of the state uh, controlling everything, that's going to get rid of the liberal traditions. Um, and, uh, you know, so that's the world that I was born into in 1944. <laughs> uh, was a welfare state uh, uh, and uh, and a huge uh, uh, element of industry nationalized, um, but it, but then people wised up a bit and uh, in Britain and it, they did they gave up the pursuit of um, total government ownership. Does all this uh, all the various topics that you cover in this book does it make you misanthropic? And if not, why not? Uh, no, it makes me sad about the future of the human species <laughs> and do dubious about how it's all going to turn out. Uh, uh, but it doesn't make me hate the human species. I quite like humans. I mean, at a distance, I don't want to be too close to too many of them. <laughs> but uh, but uh, no, I'm I'm in favor of um, I'm in favor of uh, humankind, uh, and I want to see them happy and flourishing. Um, uh, so, but um, I'm not misanthropic at all. <laughs> well, I, except towards certain people who produce, who preach certain ideas. <laughs> right, right, right. I mean, even though an absolutely mind-boggling number of them make me crazy, in my experience, still the good ones for me outweigh. They may not outnumber, but they outweigh right. Uh, right. the bad ones. Right. Well, you know. Um, uh, human beings evolved in packs, uh, and part of, and therefore it's reasonable to suppose that they have a genetic um, tendency to agree with the pack. The pack yeah. solidarity is important, uh, and this can easily, by the imagination, be transferred to a pack of millions. Even though it's really a bit absurd to do that, uh, uh, and so you have this this susceptibility of human beings to the contagion of mass delusions, um, like uh, Lysenkoism, uh, but, but uh, also in democratic countries, you know, I have this uh, three examples of um, the, the, the low-fat diet, um, uh, the, um, the global warming catastrophism, and the COVID crimes, both the lockdowns and the vaccines, these three holocausts which killed millions of people. Um, and, and which, and people, and if you watch people's behavior, it's, it's absolutely staggering to see that the behavior of people go along with this, like sheep to the slaughter. Um, and, um, uh, and, it, and, it, and, it, and, you know, it's, it's due to many things. Uh, and as I point out, one of the things is, um, 
the worship of science, because that has now replaced old time religion, um, and um, the, the government control of science, because the vast majority, ninety nine percent of government of, of, of scientific research is funded by the government, and this means that the bureaucrats who dispense the funds look for things that are relevant in their mind rather than things which are objectively interesting from a scientific point of view. And relevant in their minds mean whatever uh, ideological tsunami is, is rushing through people's brains <laughs> at that point. Uh, so, um, so, so that leads to these horrible uh, outrages. And um, that certainly, I can see why some people would despair. Well, let's um, close by directing people to either tomwoods.com slash 2444, or if you're watching on video in the description of the video, uh, for the link to the book we've been talking about, which is The Conquistador with His Pants Down, David Ramsey Steele's Legendary Lost Lectures. You know, I we can't finish this conversation with, I mean, and any other media you do for this, you're going to get the same thing. You have to justify that title. Can you do that quickly before we wrap up? Oh. Well, it, uh, that, that's, it comes from the chapter about Sigmund Freud. Uh, Sigmund Freud said, wrote, wrote to his friend, Wilhelm Fleece, uh, said, I'm not really a scientist. I'm a conquistador. Um, and my chapter on Freud, um, I show that he, that he was thoroughly dishonest in the way he reported his cases. Uh, and he said that all these people told, told him that they'd been um, seduced, as he put it, by their parents, by their fathers. Actually, not a single one of them ever told him that. This is just untrue. But he was using told originally in a metaphorical sense, meaning I could tell from their symptoms that they had been seduced by their fathers. But later on, he saw that people were taking it literally, and he played this up. Uh, so, so people who read Freud, and I read Freud um, Back in the sixties, and I, I was impressed, you know, that it, that all these patients told him that they'd been seduced by their fathers. Uh, and I, but if you read it carefully, and if you look at this, has been been deconstructed by a number of people. Uh, that if you if you look at his original notes and the first drafts of when he talked about these cases, uh, originally he says that you ha the the, the uh, patients never believed this, and you had to convince them of it. And he used to browbeat and harangue his patients, saying, no, you were seduced by your father. No, no, I can't remember that. Well, it happened. Uh, and um, uh, whether any of them ever swallowed this and agreed is still un uncertain. Uh, but uh, but it, this went out to the world as the message that these, that these patients had, um, had reported this to Freud. Well, not one of them reported it to Freud. It, this was Freud's interpretation of their symptoms. Um, and so... Um, uh, and so, uh, you know, uh, psychoanalysis, I, I don't suppose it's done as much harm as Marxism, but it is an, but it is an example of, because it didn't get political power, but, but, um, it is an example of this, uh, modern religion, which claims to be scientific, is actually totally pseudo-scientific and, and, uh, won't, won't bear examination, uh, but which captures the imagination of millions of people. Who um, who uh, think it's scientific, and that's their religion. Uh, and uh, religions like this, uh, Freud uh, psychoanalysis is now um, is now dying quickly. Uh, but um, religions like this are uh, are extremely vigorous. They're strong. They're powerful. Whereas religions like Christianity and Islam in the modern industrialized world are very feeble, uh, and um, uh, and so they give way to these scientific re religions. And the scientific religions are really, really dangerous. Um, and so, um, uh, well, the, the practical steps to alleviate this problem, I would say the biggest is stop the government funding of science. You know, there is a guy, what's his name, who's written about this and shows that... Um, oh, Terence Keeley. Yeah, that's right. One it, of the best it, episodes of the Tom Woods show ever uh, oh, was, was when I talked to him. What a brilliant, what a brilliant guy. Uh, yeah, and it shows that... Um, just purely from a scientific point of view, it'd be far better to get the government out of funding science and allow it to be funded voluntarily. Uh, uh, and, th and then uh, some of these problems would, would, uh, would go away. 
Well, uh, from your lips to God's ear. Well, let's let's use that that old expression. Well, David Ramsey Steele, author of The Conquistador with His Pants Down, thank you very much. You're welcome, and I'm very grateful to have this opportunity. Thanks. And thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Become a smarter libertarian in just 30 minutes a day. Visit TomWoods.com to subscribe to the show for free, and we'll see you next time. Like the sound of The Tom Woods Show? My audio production is provided by Podsworth Media. Check them out at podsworth.com.